I love telling stories. Now, I'm sure that's not a surprise to you. I'm a preacher, for goodness sake, but I love telling stories. In fact, if you asked me, what would be an ideal night for you? It would be good friends, good food, and telling stories. Right? I love it when somebody at the table says, do you remember when dot, 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 and you start telling old stories. My, my kids now are 16, 14, and 11, and they're definitely getting to 12, actually. Oh my word, my baby girl just turned 12 and I just said 11. Sorry, but she literally is 12. Okay, so 16, 14, 12, I gotta get the ages right. Funny story, side note. See, I told you I love telling stories. I was checking one of my children in, I will not say who, one of my three, for classes at a public school. And literally, the administrative office asked me to my face, what is your child's birthday? Yeah, I totally blanked. I totally blanked. And the truth is, this is a terrible story. I actually made it up. I just picked a month and a number and I went with it. And I definitely just picked a year. And I think I got the year right, but it's it's humiliating. Anyways, I love stories. And now it's fun to see my kids. That's where I was going at the ages they're at. To see them going, Dad, 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 tell that one story. Dad, Dad tell us again that story. Why, why do I love stories? Because I love life and I love people. And stories remind us, right? Stories help us rehearse, revisit, recall, remember these uh, practices that add so much dimension and depth and beauty to our life. Life is a story. We are living in a story. The most important, uh, one of the most important vehicles in the world is storytelling. When a, when, a, when a story is told well, it can move millions. It can move whole continents, can it? when you hear a story told well. Well, in actuality, in truth, what we're doing right now, this practice of worshiping Jesus, this practice of once a week or even twice a week, or maybe like Judah, every day I listen to a sermon and I sing songs, that's awesome. But this practice of our faith is a practice of rehearsing. It's a practice of remembering. It's a practice of revisiting. What are we remembering? What are we retelling? What are we recalling? The greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told. I was talking to a friend recently. He said the story of Jesus, even if it was fiction, which of course it is not, it would be the most compelling story ever written and put together. But what's so beautiful about what we are celebrating right now as a community in real time is that the greatest story ever told is also a true story. And when you tell that story, that is the story of God. I've said this so many times, but the world that we're living in right now has a name. And it's not Earth. It's not the universe, the galaxies, the solar systems, Pluto, the Milky Way, the Big Dipper, right? It's not the, just the planets and the stars and the moon. And, and, and it, it's, it's the story of God. This, all the planets, all the stars, all the animals, all the valleys, all the mountains, all the lakes, all the rivers, all the flowers, all the grass, all of it is, it's his story. It is the story of God. I wanna show you a scripture in the very last book in the Bible that I think sheds enormous light on the power, the potential to access the power of God when we rehearse his story. Look at this, last book of the Bible, almost one of the last portions of scripture in all of the Bible towards the end of what is the book of Revelations. Revelations chapter 19 and verse 10, as we now call it, says, I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers. This is now John on the island of Patmos having an open vision, and he sees an angel of the Lord. And this angel says, worship God. Hold the testimony of Jesus. Now listen to this statement. For the testimony or the retelling of the story of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
Now, that's a very complex statement that maybe sounds incredibly ornate and deeply spiritual. And maybe you're listening to this and right now you want to tune off. You want to change the channel, so to speak. You're like, the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. All right, that is too complex, too spiritual, too ornate, too much of a big deal for me. I don't really know what prophecy is or a spirit is or a testimony is. So I don't really know what that is. I want to explain it to you because I think we're going to discover together just in the next few minutes that you telling the story of Jesus, revisiting the story of Jesus, sharing even pieces and parts and elements of the story, one with another, makes incredible and enormous power available to you in an average, everyday, ordinary moment. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does that actually mean? Now, when you see testimony, it's a testament Right? It's, it's an eyewitness account originally, and the testimony of Jesus is it is his story, his true story. When we retell the true story of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus, the beauty of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the creativity of Jesus. When we start telling his story and who he is, the Bible says it carries with it a predictive nature. It begins to predict things in our life, which is to say, when you tell the story of Jesus, whether you say this in so many words in your native tongue or not, what it means is you are saying what Jesus did, Jesus does, and he can do in me and through me what he's done and what he does. Basically, when we tell someone, man, you know, the story of Jesus, he came and he was sinless and he was born in a barn and he lived a perfect life. And we see images of him when he's three and when he's 12 and then 30 and then 30 to 33. We have these, these diligent, detailed accounts of his three and a half year ministry. And then we have the account of his death or, or, or his mock trial, and then his death and his his, 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 the horrible torture they put him through and the crucifixion, the six hours, and then the rocks and the sky goes dark and there's an earthquake. And we retell the story. You start to make it your own. And the book of Revelation reveals it has a predictive quality to it, which means you begin to say it and you begin to declare that this is the trajectory of my life. My life is redeemed. My life is, is forgiven. My life is loved. My life is seen. My life has been architect and design, handmade by a good God who revealed himself on the person of Jesus. All of the sudden, you begin to make extraordinary power available to you. I want to give you three things, and there is so much more than three things that actually begin to happen to you emotionally, mentally, physically, when you begin to tell the story of Jesus. Now, just again for clarification, I'll say this one more time. One of the ways we can do this, particularly as we are coming out of this pandemic, is you can FaceTime somebody, you can Zoom call somebody, you can text somebody, you can call just old fashioned phone call, you know, and you just start telling someone who Jesus is and what he's done in your life. You start saying things like, man, I know God was there and I know God met me there. And the same way that God met Paul and Silas in the prison, when they were in the inner prison and they were in sewage and they thought their life was over and they started singing, that same Jesus that broke them out of prison is the same Jesus that has helped me with some of my addictions. And you start saying that, the Bible indicates you are declaring and predicting that same redemptive power is going to continue to work in your life. For instance, when you tell the story of Jesus, when you share the testimony of Jesus, now again, you don't have to do it exhaustively. You don't have to know all of the details and all the nuances of Jesus and everything he did. You don't have to have the New Testament memorized. You don't have to know exactly what town and what village and what city he was in when he did what miracle with this person or that person. Just the other day, I was playing golf with my son and he asked about a Bible story. Now, dad, what's that Bible story again? What an amazing question to get from your 16-year-old. And I just started telling him about the woman with the issue of blood, as we now call her, and 
in that story. Now, as I'm telling him that story and he's listening because he wants to get his facts straight because he can't quite totally put the story together, while I'm telling him the story, what he doesn't know, and maybe what I didn't even think about, is that there's a predictive quality. When I start telling him what Jesus did for that woman, what the Bible says is, Zion, my 16-year-old, starts to believe, whether knowingly or unknowingly, that what Jesus did for that woman, he can do for Zion. It's the same Jesus. And I hope you hear what I'm saying. So every time you recount the story of Jesus, for those of us that are followers of Jesus, there is a predictive quality in nature to it, which is extraordinary. For instance, pain. Pain is a fact of life. Pain is something we're all going to deal with in this life. doesn't matter if you are Mother Teresa. doesn't matter if you are a mass murderer. There is going to be pain. Bad people experience pain. Good people experience pain. To be honest, we're all fractured and flawed. So is there any good people? Well, we do good things, don't we? Right. So even people who do bad things and even people who do good things, both are going to experience pain. But you can predict how you'll handle the pain by telling the story of Jesus. What do I mean by that? By recounting the goodness of Jesus. For instance, if you and I went to coffee and I sat down with you and personally right now, and I hope that you feel the same way, I have been experiencing extraordinary amounts of pain. Just in the area of justice in the United States of America and the long road ahead of us for many people groups in this country who deserve true equality and justice. I've experienced pain. A lot of it is the pain of my brothers and sisters that maybe don't look like me in this country. And I have often felt pain and I've often felt overwhelmed and I've often felt like it's insurmountable and I've often felt like we can't fix this and I've often felt like so many systems are inundated with flawed, selfish humanity serving themselves and marginalizing people not like them, right? It's it's an overwhelming task to truly fight racism. But if you and I went to coffee, though I'm experiencing that pain, and though maybe you're carrying that pain, when we begin to tell the miracles of Jesus, just from the Bible, let alone the miracles he's done in our lives in years past, our faith, let me say it like this, persuasion begins to work in our brain and in our body. My favorite definition of faith is divine persuasion. Now, what happens is when I'm in pain, if I will tell the story of Jesus, I get persuaded again over my pain, which is to say the pain is not eliminated. The pain is not eradicated, but the pain is superseded. And now persuasion of the goodness of God, the control of God, the sovereignty of God, the rule of God, the leadership of God is now above the pain that you and I may be experiencing. Does not lessen the pain, but it gives us hope in the pain. Now, telling the story of Jesus can do that. And in fact, you can make it work. It can can become predictive, meaning when I feel pain, one of my favorite go-to practices is finding a friend to rehearse the story of Jesus with again. Just the other day, I'm calling a friend, we're FaceTiming, and he's like, Jesus is in this room right now. He's walking around his living room. He's like, Jesus is in this room. And I'm like, he's in my room. He's like the guy who built the mountains and the valleys and the rivers and the seas and the animals. He's in my living room. And he looked at me and he said, can you make mountains and rivers and valleys? You can. He's like, but the one who can is in my room. He's here. He's alive. He's real. And you know what's incredible? Just a few days ago, that simple practice Put even the pain of humanity in its proper place where suddenly I felt like we can overcome. We can beat this. We can win. God is with us. He's in control. He's for humanity. He's for human life. We can stand with him. We can trust him. We can believe for the justice of Jesus to roll through the streets of our respective countries and continents and regions of the world. Wow. So that's right, when you share the testimony of Jesus, it can help persuade you above the pain. Not to eliminate the pain or ignore the pain because we understand that this pain is real. 
and needs to be addressed. But I believe the ultimate answer and antidote is the person of Jesus. It's the person of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, it says it right there, but let me be clear. Here's my second observation. When you begin to tell the story of Jesus, you predict your future again. You predict your future again. Are you uneasy about the future? Are you like me? Are you looking into the future wondering what's going to come of this technological age? What's going to come of us and this inundation of astronomical amounts of information? Will we make it? Come on, parents everywhere. Are you listening? Do you look at your kids? If you're like me, some teenagers and go, are they okay? Do you look around hoping that somebody will assure you that they will, but the truth is nobody knows because nobody's been this far in history. We've never been this far, right? Cars are driving us now. We're finding new ways to get, put. I've heard rumors of a train that's gonna get us from LA to New York in under an hour. Come on, bullet train, we want you, you know? But there's all kinds of inventions and technologies and, and I think a lot of it is good, but a lot of it is very taxing, isn't it? I'm wondering, are our brains okay? Are our bodies okay? Is anxiety at an all-time high? Is the future promising? Is the best yet to come? Right? Is it better to get information and news about every part of the world and not read the local newspaper? You know, but we don't know yet, do we, totally? We don't know if this is going to affect us or hurt us or harm us or help us. And so the future, in a lot of ways, can be daunting. It can make us weary. I'm weary of the future. I don't know if the future is going to be as promising and bright as we once thought. I remember in 1997, I know forever ago, when I graduated Issaquah High School, shout out to everyone who lives in Issaquah. Issaquah is a wonderful city in the state of Washington, just outside of Seattle, for those who care to know. It's where I went to high school in 1997, I graduated. And I remember thinking in 1997, oh man, what is ahead of me is so great. And now I look at my 16 year old in 2021 and I think, is he excited about graduating high school? Does he feel like there's great things ahead? And some would argue, of course, but some would argue it's changing and maybe people aren't as optimistic and full of faith. I got, I got a message for you. I got a scripture for you. Revelation 19.10 reveals that when you tell the story of Jesus, you predict your future again. You predict what's gonna happen tomorrow. Here's what I mean. When you tell the story of Jesus, you anchor yourself to no matter what happens to this little blue and green planet, tomorrow, guaranteed, you will be fully loved by God. You will be fully forgiven by God and you will be fully free to love and serve one another. What? Yeah, loved, forgiven, free, guaranteed tomorrow. Plan on it and predict your future. How? Tell the story of Jesus again. Remind yourself you're forgiven. Remind yourself how loved you are. Remind your friend over coffee that we're free. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. What am I free from? I'll tell you what, number one, you're free from shame. There is now therefore no condemnation, no condemning sentence, no dead end. No dead end for anyone who puts their faith in Jesus. That dead end turns into an on-ramp to a highway where you can begin to experience fulfilled life, a fulfilled life that's anchored to fully loved, fully forgiven, fully free. That is fulfillment. No, you can't predict your job security. No, you can't predict the economy. No, you can't predict interest rates. No, you can't predict the stock market. We can't and we won't, but we can predict our quality of days in life by anchoring ourselves to eternal truth. And when we tell the story of Jesus, please hear me, it allows us, even in an evening, to anticipate the next morning and the next morning after that, because every day begins to take on the shape of gift, begins to take on the shape of opportunity and honor and gift. 
that has been given to you by the great creator of breath and life and brains and bodies themselves, God. And now you know this day, I am fully loved, forgiven and free. And tomorrow I shall be again. When we tell the story of Jesus, we predict our future. And lastly, I'll ask this question in conclusion. How's your planning going? This is something we don't want to talk much about. How difficult is it to plan right now? I had an email today about an activity that my family and I enjoy, and we were told to participate in this hobby and activity. We're going to need a proof of a COVID test on that day and, and be completely vaccinated as an entire family. And suddenly you're like, I, what used to just take a ride in the car and a few dollars, now it's a little complex. I literally had a buddy who also enjoys the same kind of hobby. And he's like, no way am I doing that anymore. It's too much to ask. It's like, well, even our plans have been so disrupted and interrupted. How you doing with your planning? How you doing with like, oh, I don't want to make plans for, you know, I'm thinking about my kids graduating high school, college. Like what, what's, the, what's the world going to look like? Speaking of the future, can we make plans? How do we make plans? And I want to show you, just in a moment, I want, to, I want to show you how, again, by telling the story of Jesus, you plan on Jesus directing your life. Now, I love this scripture in Proverbs. It says, man plans his way. So in other words, man is supposed to make plans. God, God, he directs your steps. Which is to say, go ahead and make your plans, but count on the director being involved every, every day. No, 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 every step in every day. Your great director, the director of the ages, is guiding and walking and leading and helping and prodding and prompting and showing you the way you are to go. Do you know every time you tell the story of Jesus and what he's done on this planet, his work, his ministry, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, you start talking about the miraculous life of Jesus who lives forevermore. And he, he sits in the heavens and he laughs at all those who oppose him and his enemies. This same Jesus, when you do that, you say, God, we're going to make plans, but we are counting on your direction. We are counting on your direction. Ephesians 5.19 says this, Keep speaking to each other with words of Scripture, singing the Psalms with praises and spontaneous songs given to you by the Spirit of Jesus. Keep speaking to each other with words of Scripture, singing the Psalms, singing songs and praises, spontaneous songs you write in your mind about God. Sing it to each other. Nowhere in Ephesians 19 says we all have to have a beautiful voice. But it does say as we practice this telling the story, it literally means sing the story. It means speak the story. It means write spontaneous songs at the moment that you can sing to yourself in the shower about the story. And by doing that, well, you're doing so much for the journey you're on. You are telling your future that all the outrageous faith-filled plans you've made, the reason you are confident is not because you're a great planner, it's because he's a perfect director. He's a perfect director. Anybody will tell you in art, any kind of art, you think of movie productions, right? The director is the genius only because the director can take a script, the plan, but in the moment the director can make adjustments that make the story come alive. Oh, make no mistake about it. God is the director of the universe. And boy, he's perfect. He'll direct your steps. He'll direct your life. I can only imagine what it's like where you are right now in the world. I can only imagine, and I do oftentimes, I imagine what incredible members of Church Home may be going through. 
I think about those in Texas, I think about those in Florida, I think about those in Singapore, I think about those in South Africa, I think about those all over the world, I think about those in Japan, I think about those worshiping with us from Iraq, I think about people all over the world, from Canada to Mexico to Brazil, all over the world, people are practicing their faith here in community at church home. And I think about what you might be facing and going through. The unpredictable nature of life is almost too much to bear these days. And yet, Revelation 19.10 gives us a clue and a key, and truly a revelation from the book of Revelations. It says, when you tell the story of Jesus over and over, you are predicting that what you're saying is going to happen to you. God's going to lead you. God's going to guide you. God's going to provide for you. God's going to restore. God's going to forgive. God's going to heal. God's going to guide. He's going to do it. Isn't it amazing? One more time, let me read Ephesians in chapter 5 and verse 19. Church home, please hear these words today. Hey, church home, keep speaking to each other. Keep speaking to each other with words of Scripture. Use the Bible to speak to each other. Sing to each other the Scriptures. Sing the Psalms. I I, I know Easter was so... Uh, 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 radical. It was such a beautiful day with people worshiping all over the world. And I had the privilege to gather with a few people in Seattle and, and we, we were singing together and just hearing each other sing around an auditorium. I was in a room not long ago with just about six or seven of us and we turned on a worship song. We just started singing together and here's seven or eight of us in a room and it could have been seven or 8,000, right? And we started singing together and I can't explain to you and maybe you've never been able to explain to someone else, but when we sing together, well, Ephesians 5:19 says, when we sing together, we encourage one another. We're retelling the story of Jesus and we're saying he's gonna do it again. He did it once, he's gonna do it again. He's gonna guide, he's gonna lead, he's gonna, he's gonna protect. He's going to provide. He's going to heal. He's going to restore. This is what he does. So church home, you keep, you keep speaking to each other with words that you get from the Bible. Sing the scripture to each other and use spontaneous songs that God gives you by his spirit. I believe in these last few moments, what I've shared with you is such an integral, important part of our spiritual practice and journey. We are going to need each other to tell the story. I need you to tell me the story. You need me to tell you the story. And together we encourage one another and we say again, God, do it in my life again and again and again and again. I hope you feel so encouraged today. I hope you get a sense of hope and divine persuasion. God is not far from you, friend. God is with you. And just like my buddy said the other day, that's right, the maker of heaven and earth is in the room with you right now. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity we have to come to your story again. It's wild to think that we've read two verses in a story of thousands upon thousands of verses. And yet those two verses have once again given us so much to think about and talk about. We love you. You're incredible, Jesus. I pray for every hurting, broken, wounded person watching right now. And I pray, God, you would be closer to that man or woman than their next breath. May they sense your spirit near and close. Thank you, God. Secondly, if you're here and you're watching this wherever you are in the world and you would like to receive the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus offers, I want to encourage you to do that right now. In fact, just lift up your hand. It might just be you watching this by yourself. You might even be in an airplane. Just lift up your hand. Say, that's me. By simply responding, receiving, you are forgiven forever. This is what it means to be saved. Not earned, deserved, or warranted, just received. So if you have received the free gift of forgiveness that Jesus paid for and purchased in his own body and proved that he had the power to do it because he got up 
from the grave and beat death itself so that we knew he has the power over sin, death, hell, and the grave. You're forgiven forever.